Pottstown is only 90 minutes from NFL Films, but none of us have been back in 30 years. Now, there's a nuclear power plant next door to the hotel where we used to stay. We didn't expect to find anyone who remembered a minor league team that lasted only two seasons three decades ago. Bob, there's Bob. Well, we were wrong. Chuz. Good to see you. Yeah, good name. to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Bob was Bob. the president of the Firebirds. Wow. Yeah. This, this is, is like Jeff five years old. Hey, Jeff, how are you? He, Jeff, was like, are you? he was like four years old the last time we were here, so he didn't make the trip. No. <laughs> come on, come on, let's go. Now. I couldn't believe they come up to see a minor league football team. Phil and Steve, they were all over. They followed us at every game. Good comeback, though, you know, Steve? Huh? All right, now, Sunday, hey, wh wh where's Tucket at, Phil? Just gonna play a game, we're just gonna break the huddle on the cold plays. I recognize this, isn't this the street we shot King Cochran waltzing down the street? Yeah, when yeah. he came in, he had the yeah. checkered pants, pants and the red, yeah. and the red yeah. coat. What would you say to him if he walked in here right now? You're still the king. How you doing, big guy? I'll give him a big handshake and a big hug. He's still the king. He gets side kept tell him in half, he gets taken down every time. When I met Coach Dave, um, I got to see an inside part of life that I would have never seen. He was number one in my life, and he always will be. I got to meet the players and to say, hey, I was a ball boy when, when Jack Dolvin's in the NFL now, and Jack Dolvin was here, and I changed his cleats on his spikes. Our pastor at that time was the chaplain for the Firebirds, Reverend H.L. Butler, because uh, when you, whenever you hear, heard him pray, <laughs> if you want to move, something was wrong. And together we pray, we, we can do. All things. All things. We thank you. We thank you. Our game for this. Amen. Mr. Ross, may I shake your hand? You got my vote, brother. I think the legacy of Joe Blake, I mean, you know, he was a good man. He was a very good man. And he took time from it. And especially in a time, early 70s, when maybe there was some racial problems. And here is this, this very huge African-American ball player taking this little white boy and under his wing and I'm just I mean he just more or less did everything in the world for me I got taken off this Joe Namath story that I was working on I said Jesus I got to, you know going from Joe Namath that had been 69 the Jets have won the Super Bowl what do I get to do I get to go to Potsdam yeah, that's great. Yeah. but I had the greatest time absolutely had the greatest time wouldn't have traded it for an NFL season or anything else Ironically, the same season that we discovered the Firebirds, watch it, watch it. a New York writer named Jay Acton also appeared on the Pottstown sidelines. And while we were shooting our network TV special, he was writing a book called The Forgettables. I just think that if you wanted to write a novel, you couldn't have come up with something that was as mythic as this was. They were one play from an undefeated uh, season, which at that level of uh, professional football had never been done before. And the game in Hartford was just like something out of King Arthur or in medieval England or something like that. They could have played it on horses that day. Like Jay Acton, we knew we had stumbled into a once-in-a-lifetime sports story. And we couldn't have asked for a better end. We've filmed a lot of snowy games on the frozen tundras of the NFL. But none were more dramatic than that day in Hartford. You don't get that many moments when it's as good as that. At 21, whether you're a writer, a player, or a coach, you don't have the expectation of maybe this won't happen or will happen again. But, uh, you know, Dave was fond of saying that uh, we would only go this way once, and that was, that was really true. Again, I keep repeating, and I hate to sound like a horse's ass. Fellas, we've got the work to win it all the way. And you're never going to have this opportunity. I'm telling you right here, the middle of this dear place right here, right? This is the greatest opportunity of any of you ever had. Most wonderful experience of my life. Most wonderful. It was a sad day when, you know, when they left. It's a sad day. People always ask how they felt when they left. Well, they never did leave. You know, the Firebirds never left because the stories are here. And my son has heard the stories. And no doubt, someday he'll tell his son the stories. 100 years from now, the Firebirds will still be here. When we first wired Dave DeFilippo for sound, I told him this is the same microphone that we used on Vince Lombardi. 
Well, Dave did everything possible to emulate his idol, including talking with his hands. Go over with Milton just a little bit, you know. If we go, we'll go for the field goal. We'll get them up front real tough, right? And stick and be sure they cover. The toot was there. Tommy, you will run off. But Dave did differ from Vince in one way. He never wore socks or underwear. It was a waste of time for Dave because, you know, it took time to put underwear and socks on. He never wore socks. And it was quite a fad because I picked it up myself, you know? I did. Dave let us shoot everything that season. He was like an actor playing the part of a minor league football coach. And I bet shrimp for a dollar apiece. As of this moment, we have three or four from this, and the real surprises. They're probably most better than most National League drafts, like Ron Holiday and Jack Dalton. Did you say that, Ron? But I mean, the guy we almost overlooked 30 years ago was Ron Waller. This quiet, dapper coach seemed out of place in Pottstown and actually overqualified for the job. Big man for you. Anytime he needs, you got to out to him or hit. Right. Safe stuff. That's good. That's good. He had been a star running back with the Los Angeles Rams, and after the Firebirds, he went on to become head coach of the San Diego Chargers. Today, Waller owns a string of standard-bred trotting horses in Seaford, Delaware. After slighting him in the original film, we weren't sure how Waller would react to us 30 years later. Well, that didn't matter because what you folks did and, and did a great job of putting that production on, I thought it was wonderful. And uh, as far as me being in the background, I didn't mind because we were being successful on the field. And, you know, eventually I got a contract in the National Football League and went on to coach with the Chargers. Jimmy, he got it! Jimmy had it. Dave never ever bothered me. I just, he, I just ran the ball club and he never said anything about it. Your post curl was there. Post curl was there. All he wanted to do was win. Lion wing, lion wing. 28 toss, crack. Crack. Dave really was the master motivator, but Ron, Ron really did all the technical stuff of uh, coaching, and, and he was absolutely brilliant at it. Strong left, see? Formation strong left. I was very unprepared for sort of this level of sophistication at, uh, at, in Potsdam, Pennsylvania. Yeah, well, this team is predominantly man for man, as you know. You see zone on occasion. We go into our trips, ram or what have you. You got it? Now, our football is damn entertaining football. I get my kicks this way, pal. And I think a lot of other people can too, you know, by watching this. In all due respect, he was what he was, a good promoter, a good hustler. And in all due respect, he wasn't really a good football coach. We really didn't care who came up with the game plan. We knew one thing. Coach Dave was a filmmaker's dream. We missed his locker room tirade after King Corcoran's interception cost him an undefeated season. So Dave agreed to restage it six months later for the benefit of our cameras. Tired of that damn stuff, I'll tell you. Oh, I fumbled up again. <laughs> Holy shit. And we filmed it in it the downstairs so bathroom at NFL Films. It comes out so easily. Sorry, Lord. Team president Bob Calvario came in to, to help Dave get back in the mood. And what he saw that day would do a Hollywood method actor proud. I, I moved away. I yeah. thought he was he was breathing heavy. And then when he breathed, he sprays. And man, I said, oh, look at this. And, and yeah, he, he didn't have to act it. He was still angry. This is coaching, Bob. This is coaching. Actors and O's, you buy a million idiots for that shit. And, 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 you know, you come this way all these years. I've been through it. And just to, just to win this one, just to win this one, it was the most important game in the world to me. It was a Super Bowl twice to me and to them and to a lot of kids out there. It the definitely boat, broke his heart because he was looking for that uh, undefeated season. And he would have had it, definitely. Because, you know, his aspiration was to go move on to the NFL. Everyone has that aspiration. Concerning my, my being, uh, being going up to the NFL, it, it, it's, it's important and not uh, being here is, 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 I have the same satisfaction. I would like to prove by going to the National League that you can do the, the same principles, principles that are involved and I think I could be successful up there. I really feel that way. Not to discredit Dave at all. He was a wonderful man and I just don't think he was an NFL caliber coach.
you know, there are many people who could look at a Dave and say that he was a failure, that he didn't make the big time, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't feel that way. I feel that uh, Dave taught a lot of people, his players, myself, lots of things, lots of life lessons. And in the end, maybe that's more important than just having a job in the National Football League. To me, Dave DeFilippo did something better than make it to the NFL. He made a lasting impression this beautiful. on everyone he ever met. Dave died suddenly of a heart attack in 1983. In the original film, we had big plans for defensive tackle Bill Stetz. If there had been a bouncer at Woodstock, he would have looked like Bill Stetz. He was a classic 70s hippie who lived in a commune outside Pottstown and he made silver jewelry. At the same time though, Stetz was an absolute warrior on the field. He was drafted by the New Orleans Saints and he played one season with the Eagles. But his role in the film was wiped out by the scene-stealing antics of Coach Dave, Joe Blake, and the King. This is the stuff we should have used. Roll three, Bill Stetz. <laughs> Beauty. I started playing and and they hit just as hard as uh, some of those guys in the NFL do. It really surprised me. There's a lot of good ball players there that, uh, for various reasons, aren't in the NFL. It's just so peaceful out here. It just sets your mind at ease. It's really, it's the nicest place I've ever lived, really. I, I'd like to think that I'm, uh, I'm pretty peaceful. <laughs> Are you against violence? Such. As such, but not in not in a game or a sport or uh, in football. I mean, it's a different thing. I have a different uh, interpretation you know, of violence in football. It's it's on a different level than violence in war or violence in uh, streets and, and so forth. I don't do it strictly just just for the pleasure of hurting someone. I, I do it just to unwind. Football is in a form of a way that a lot of people unwind and relieves their tensions and pressures. It's hard to find a team that will put up with anyone who who tries to express himself in, well, in this way anyway. They, they try to shape you into uh, their little pattern they have established in their own minds and it, it was kind of hard for any ball player to have any individuality when he came from college. Right away if you didn't have a crew cut if your hair wasn't uh, down to your scalp and uh, you didn't wear the clothes that they expected you to wear, right away you started off on the wrong foot and put yourself in jeopardy of getting cut or uh, displeasing uh, one of the coaches who can cut you, you know, and it's kind of rough. Defopo, well he said I don't give him any trouble, I'm not a troublemaker and I've, I'm always at practices and everything else, he says he, he doesn't care if I grow my hair down to my shoulders as long as I can play football. Billy Stats. <laughs> Billy, I don't know where to kiss you or play it, but anyway. <laughs> we found Bill Stats 30 years later, living in a cypress forest near Ocala, Florida. He's still working with his hands, although it's more painful now. My hands have gotten uh, really bad from uh, osteoarthritis, so I can't work long periods of time, so I started carving. It was something to do because I'm not used to just sitting around doing nothing. It's just a hobby. I just pick it up when I can. I may work 15, 20 minutes some days, an hour and the next, and put it down and pick it up. If nothing else, uh, football teaches you how to live with pain. You know? <laughs> because people used to tell me when I was a kid playing football, well, you're going to be sorry when you get older and you're going you're gonna to be uh, crippled for life. No, you don't believe them when you're a kid. You know, Nothing hurts you. But when I turned about 40, uh, things started uh, turning around on me and, and I noticed that it was, it was some of these things were permanent and then when I had my hips uh, replaced uh, it was a sure you know a sure thing so I guess I'm used to pain because when I went in to uh, have my hips looked at uh, uh, there was no cartilage left in them uh, it's still it was no cure-all it, it still hurts yeah my only regret is that I'm I can't play anymore <laughs> I wish I could have played more Get the jump on him now, man! What goes through my mind now is, geez, you know, they're more understanding now. They let anybody play. More 
football players and that are playing in the NFL now that are in armed robberies and all kinds of other crap going on, you know, and you go, what, what was so bad about us? <laughs> why could you know, why couldn't I play with long hair? <laughs> why couldn't Joe Blake play? He could have gone to drug counseling. <laughs> Still like in a daze, man. You know, like Stitz, where's your mind? Where's my what? Where's your mind? My mind. I'm, I'm sitting here talking to you, man. You're I'm way listening. off someplace, you know. I'm listening. I'm just letting you rap to yourself. That's <laughs> no, I'm trying to get myself together, man. I mean, I just not real. I'm gonna tell you, I'm not ready, man. Something's wrong with me tonight. I don't, I don't know. Want to interrupt I mean, your train it's daytime, you know. Hey, Dave. That little. Ref, don't ever get him again. It's a second You'll time. You'll never find two more contrasting teammates than King Corcoran and Bill Stetz. Mother's He was a good ball player. He was. Uh, but I think he was also a very selfish ball player. Damn, he's sending the wrong plays. That's Bush League shit. I don't think any ball player can respect a person who, uh, who thinks he can uh, take liberties, you know, that they can't take. This is King Corcoran calling long distance. He had a lot of potential and he had a great arm. If he was a different person, probably would have been, he, we wouldn't have seen him. He'd have been in the NFL the rest of his career. But his personality was his biggest, uh, he was his own worst enemy. The King is taking advantage of this league. That's, that's what I think. One of my most vivid memories from that championship game in Hartford is number 26 a tough little running back named John Land. On a day when most players had trouble just standing up, John seemed to glide through that snowy landscape. Land was impressive then, and he still is today. Briefly to He's an energy company system. vice president in Wilmington, Delaware. Here, we'll still maintain an executive presence here. I never had a vision to think that I would end up in a corporate environment, and especially a vice president of a corporation um, such as Connective. Back then, John Land was smart, feisty, and a little sarcastic around our cameras. All right, well, let's be nationwide. <laughs> What about a shaving commercial after this, fellas? <laughs> Roll nine. Roll nine. Bus. What, is this an exclusive? Land had spent time with the Colts and the Eagles, and he was bitter about his NFL experience. In this scene, a last-minute cut from the original film, Land speaks for all minor leaders. We're talking about Shula. One week ago, John Land was a running back for the Philadelphia Eagles. Today, he's a firebird on a bus to Norfolk, Virginia. His thoughts are on the NFL. You know, you go in the office and you sit down and talk, and all the, the officials, the coaches, and the general managers, they want, they want to feel you and see if you're a solid player or not. At any ball club you go to, they, all, they always do that. They have a tendency to wrap their arm around you, to grab you, and want to palpitate you, if you will. Get their hands on a football player and feel how solid or flabby they were. And when I was with the Baltimore Colts, um, I was aware of this potential technique and I wanted to avoid it at all costs because it, it, it was akin to, well, I'm a piece of meat and a slave, so therefore, let them grab me. She would walk around and pull me to the left and the right and put his hand on top of my head. And after he got tired of feeling, then he said, well, no, Steve, you look Steve's. So then I stood back to back with Don Shula and Rosenblum walking around. He had a couple of fields on, you know. I look back on it and I said, well, Based on the money they pay today, they could grab and palpitate me all they want. It wouldn't make a difference. And let Cochran go because he told Williams to go get the football one time. <laughs> he say, yeah, say he threw a pass and nobody caught it. He said, he say you, will you, will you go get the ball? John, John, you missed the hole, John. I didn't miss the hole. Did I first met Jimmy, I was like, who is this guy? Who this guy to think he rules the world? I mean, and you're just another player like I am. I'm sorry, John. I just wanted to get the first down. Because John can't see. He's fucking eyes like a pineapple. So I remember going to Ron Wallace saying, you ought to fire that guy because I can't play for him. I mean, all he wants to do is throw the ball. He's not a team player, so get rid of him. Come on, Jack. Just catch the ball. Come on, Jack. The King was also on Jack Dolben's case. I told him, yeah. He said he's a punchy kid if he only knew what the he was doing. See, when I look at you, when I look at you, still into your, you're still going into your move. You got to really drive him into the rookie the wide receiver couldn't believe what he was hearing. Maybe that was just part of his act, you know, part of uh, the persona being the king. Maybe he felt that he had to be the Joe Willie Namath uh, of, of minor league football. Jack, next time we get down to Jack, drive quick and bring it out quick. All right, it don't take so long into the move. On the first uh, touchdown play that where King threw the ball. Hit, hit. 
we get the ball, and King hits Don Alley on a short out. That's it, huh? All right, King, all right, way to throw that ball, King! And says, yay, King, way to go, King. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, that's the King. The King of <laughs> Yeah, don't worry about it, you hear? Don't worry, hey. I don't worry, that's the simplest thing in the world. I threw a hard ball. I really drilled that damn thing. Well, we did love him. I, I think we still do. There you go, King, you beautiful mother, you. It's right. kind of like we can, we can talk about him ourselves, but don't let anybody else talk about him. No, he's, he may be a but he's our yeah, That's right. right. We're going to take it, Jack. We're going to take every thing they yeah, give us like, all day. Let's just do Tracking it. down Jack Dolben wasn't difficult. He's a chiropractor in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, which is 50 miles up the road from Pottstown. After Pottstown, he played for the Schuylkill County Coal Crackers. Then, he played for the WFL Chicago Fire, and finally, he made it to the NFL with the Denver Broncos. I made the Denver Broncos team, and then actually not only made the team, but ended up starting for uh, 67 consecutive games. It was more than a dream come true. It was almost uh, uh, a miracle come true. But the culmination of all that, humanly speaking, I guess, it was the Super Bowl. But even playing in Super Bowl XII didn't measure up to Pottstown. Heart and character is what's missing in the game today, and that's what we had in Pottstown. The, uh, the Pottstown Firebirds were a remarkable group of, of uh, misfits. Back in those days in Pottstown, that's the way the game was meant to be played. Without Pottstown, you're right, the NFL would not have happened in a training camp out in Pomona, California. Somebody did something, jumped off sides or held, or, and he said, uh, where do you think you're playing, Pottstown? And I couldn't resist it. You know, all of a sudden, all the, the, the loyalties and defensive mechanisms clicked in at the same time. And I said, Coach, we didn't do that stuff back in Pottstown. I said, we played the game right back there. Pottstown was a typical working class community. But on a hill overlooking town stood the mansion of America's underwear king, Ed Gruber. He was the largest underwear manufacturer in the United States at that time. We went up the hill that day because Ed Gruber was the owner of the Pottstown Firebirds. Now, I had interviewed many NFL owners, but nothing prepared me for this. <laughs> As of the day, it, it is my football team because we have reorganized and uh, the original team I have bought out, the original owners. He enjoyed life, okay? You go to his house, and I've been to his house, he had a bar that had every kind of liquor that you could name in there. It's time-consuming. When, when I say time-consuming, it's, it's a 6 a.m. to 12, 12 p.m. job because you become involved with all the personalities of people. And I think when he imbibed a little bit too much, this different side of him came out. So I pick a combination between the wealth that he had and this habit that he had would have people either love him or hate him. Remember, we, we, had, a, we had a room together. He used to hide the bottle up in the chandelier. All right. All right. You're going to ask me about players. Is that it? We start with nobody. Without a single player, <laughs> Coach Dave put uh, together a team, and I think the results of his effort will speak for, him, for themselves. They can't get mad at me now. Yeah. Get ahead. They're the only team in, uh, in our division. We only play once. <laughs> Dave wouldn't wear any underwear. That really ticked Ed Gruber off. Because <laughs> Ed Gruber makes over one third of the underwear sold in the United States. <laughs> he'd go down to the field when we were, when we were coach was coaching down here and he'd look under his shirt to see if he was wearing underwear because he ordered him to wear underwear. I try to talk to our football players on the same basis that I talk to knitters, sewing machine operators, shippers. Pro, uh, fiery processors, the great pleasure of being on the sidelines is seeing that offensive team come running back to the bench after they've scored a touchdown. And to me, that's the reward 
of standing on the sidelines. These are young men, great men, you know. And the greatest satisfaction I have in the world is being, and when I say the greatest satisfaction I have in the world, I hope you take it at least figuratively, is to walk in the locker room and have these great big 265 people come around and throw their arms around me and rub their sweaty faces all over me and my clothes. And to me, that's to go, it's men. great. Hey. All right, Mr. Groove, ready to go. <laughs> nice going. All right, Vince. <laughs> Jim Cochran is a great quarterback, and he will be. I told him last night, and I'll tell you that Jim Cochran today, if he wished to be, if he would had would uh, had the personality and would forget all his Joe Namath uh, ideals, if he would uh, forget them, he's young enough, he has six or seven years to go, that he can still be one of the five or six best quarterbacks in pro football today. The most complex character on that Firebird team was defensive end Joe Blake. He was a poet, mystic, a Jimi Hendrix freak who lived in the team boarding house which was called the Firebird Roost. Ron Waller had brought him to town as a talented but troubled project. In other words, I would try to pick up players that I thought maybe I could help out and get them back into the National Football League. And Joe Blake was one of those guys, great athlete, but just very undisciplined as an individual. But come game time, he played. Now, I don't know what he was using or what he was taking or whatever. But. He was quick, quick as a cat. He didn't look like a football player. He looked kind of fat and chunky. But man, when that ball snapped, he was like a frog. You know, he leaping over linemen and grabbing a quarterback by himself. And phew, he was like a Superman. Uh, he really was good. We're going to win because we got a bigger wheel, that's why. Get off my ass. He's already on my case because I cussed at him. That's why I let him do it. But he had too many distractions and, and not focused enough on really what he wanted to accomplish, I think, in life. I, I demand more of myself, you know. I guess maybe it's that verbal way of perfection or something, never really being satisfied, you know, completely. Joe was always in trouble doing something, coming late to practice, not coming to practice, disappearing, staying out all night. He been tipping toe to the tulips. Mikey Dave used to always tell me, you know, like, uh, he says, you gotta sacrifice, you know, lay off the women. And he'll, and he'll hit you with something like, he'll be saying, sure, sure. And he'll hit you like, sins of the flesh you pay for here on this earth, you know. And you stop, I stopped and looked at him and I said, what is he talking about? And he says, I have a direct communicate with the man upstairs. He says, you can't fool me, I know what you're doing, you know. Joe. Roll one, Blake suspension, roll one. Blake Coach Dave was so into the making of our film that he asked our permission to suspend Joe Blake for one game. Well, we said sure, as long as we could be there to shoot There's it. There's a reason I won a title with the Continental oh, League, Coach, come and on. I have you the formula. And you don't have to be with us or with us. It don't make any difference to me. I'm you know, well, it's up to me, there, Coach. not you, Joe. You know, yeah. Joan will give you a letter. Joan will give you a letter. Well, Blake had been busted for heroin for the second time that season by the Pottstown police okay. chief, Dick Tracy. Sure. Yeah, Dick Tracy, that was really his name. Sure, sure. Well, Joe was not only cool about us shooting the scene, he even stayed around to help Dave stay in character for his reaction cutaways. Yeah, yeah. Hey, just 10 more get seconds. Get, get those eyes. And those beats look like zoom in on me, like sure. Yeah, hey. Just shake your head like that, like, yeah, just like that, like, no, do that, 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 do when he was with Pottstown, he was high as much as he was in full uh, control of his capacities. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, the way he was going, he was definitely uh, showing signs of uh, mental instability there. You know? 
I think he was taking drugs all the time. Even when he was up in the Canadian League, uh, he came down and uh, borrowed money a couple times, and I hated to loan money to him because I knew what he was going to use the money on. He was just addicted to drugs, and there was no way that he could get gotten off of it. I know he came for a tryout camp at the World Football League in Philadelphia when I was coaching there in, I think it was 74, and he was decimated looking, and it just... He was talking kind of crazy, you know? He was talking about going out to the desert and seeing 30-foot tarantulas, and uh, you know the way Joe talks real fast, and he just keeps going, like... Quicksilver, look out. Hey, now, gotta get one more mix with even number. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He was in bad shape. I mean, he looked like the typical homeless person that you would see. They never did give him a tryout because they were a little afraid of where he was coming from and his problems that he, right then and that. And I heard after that that he disappeared, so. I only know through hearsay that he's been dead for quite some time. Now, that's hearsay. What I heard after that is that he passed away in the Norristown State Hospital, um, and that's a hospital where the insane go. Well, here we are at the uh, Norristown State Mental Hospital, which is behind me right here, and we were hoping we could come down here to film uh, and trying to find Joe Blake, and of course we learned real quickly that they're not allowing any cameras inside, and they, they just don't want any filming in there, or even want to discuss it because of confidentiality laws. So it's kind of like having a little rumor maybe where he was, but now running into another roadblock of trying to run it down. And it's just curious now what really did happen to Joe, or where is he, or how is he doing if he's still alive. And I would often ask people, where is Joe Blake? I want to go see him. And to feel like he died right in my own backyard, not thinking he have a, had a friend, it really saddens me. I hope the story's not true. He gave so much to end up with nothing. My impression of Joe Blake on the whole is that he just had found no peace within himself uh, for some reason or another. And uh, I hope he's found it wherever he is. Like my man Hendrix used to say, and I dug him a lot in his, in his little quaint ways, he would come up to say things. And he says, I am what I am, thank God. You know, some people just don't understand. And that's the way it is with pro football players. We have to be this way. And we are what we are. Thank God, some people just don't understand. After six months of research, we had a film, but we didn't have a king. James P. Corcoran had simply disappeared. We even put a private detective on the case, but the best he could do was find the king's son, Jimmy Jr., who was a real estate salesman in Florida. This is his uh, 1974 Philadelphia Bell game jersey. I got this for Christmas, 1975, and I've, I've kept it ever since. I'm going to frame it one day. Uh, this is um, 1974, his first game against the Portland Storm. And uh, he sucked it in his cheeks because my mother said he had a rounded look to his face and he felt like uh, it'd give him a better jawline. When I picture him in my head, that's what he is. He's 32 years old with his belly and a white jersey on, throwing the pads with the long hair, and yeah, that's how I remember him. I was 10 years old, I was in the locker room, I, I worked in the equipment room, I used to help him get his uniform ready, and it just brings back good memories. <laughs> Tonight, oh yeah, he's, he's running, he takes about a three-yard step, he falls down, kill the king, kill the king, kill the queen, screw you guys. You ain't killing nobody. We gave, we gave you two, two guys, we, we gave, gave you two. two. This king's not over yet. <laughs> come on, come on. Oh, you brothers, you know this. I kill the bastards. Well, I remember going to the game with my mother, and I had a number nine jersey on. It was a Corcoran jersey, the little green imitation of his uh, Potsdam Firebird jersey. And we're at the game, and people are screaming, I kill the queen, poke his eyes out. They're booing the king already, right? <laughs> I'm getting abused already. And uh, my mother told me, real quietly, Jimmy, zip up your jacket. I don't want them to see the number nine, because they're going to throw beer on us. <laughs> yeah, I was a little kid, and the neighbors would come over, show them your seven-step drop back. All right, you, you better catch this now. Let's go. Give me a huddle again. Come on. Okay, call an audible. Let's go, let's you know, go, let's do a three-step drop back, quick slant. So you know? the ball snap, go get him, Jim. I, it was never fun. I just never had a good time doing it. You just go get somebody. Go in and get the guy with the ball, all right? It's like he, he, he hid behind the king character. I mean, he, he, he'd go to a restaurant with him. He, wouldn't, he didn't know how to order. My mother would order. He'd be pointing at the food. He, he just, he, social skills were very, very, very lacking. So the king character, like, took care of everything. Huh, you going to beat the game side anything? Yeah. How's your new Lincoln? Pretty good, pretty good. Yeah, I got my phone in there, you know, the whole bit. As I got older and I started getting, I'm bigger than he is now. I'm a little, I'm taller and I, I'm a little bit more muscular than he was. 
and he was having problems with it. I remember I was in college, and I called my mother to tell her I'd bench pressed 300 pounds. And uh, he came home from work in a suit, and my mother told him, he said, Jimmy got 300 pounds? And she said, yeah. He went into the basement with a suit and tie and bent, had to get 310. My mother spotted him. All right, listen, I got to get going. I got to get going to practice. Put them all in one pile, send me the bill, okay? Good enough. I'm not hey, sure what Jimmy's doing that, now. That, that, the last time I saw Jimmy, he was riding a polo, an Apollo match, and he had a string of horses down in the Washington area, right down by the Capitol. This is 1985 when he became a polo player, and he bought me a uniform, to, so I thought, thinking I maybe would join him, but uh, I actually couldn't ride the horse. You know, if you know Jimmy, he's always muscular up top, tanned and well-groomed, riding these little tiny horses that you get in polo matches. It looked unusual. It didn't look normal. It looked like um, Godzilla riding a dog. It's a V-spread. He saw that in Pump and Iron, and he liked the pose. It's to make his um, waistline look small and his chest big. And he would come over and knowing Jimmy says, how do you, what do you think, guys? How do I look? How do I look? He said, Jimmy, you look funny out there on that little horse. Look like your feet were dragging the ground. And I remember vividly, this would be 1983, we're going to buy a new Corvette for my mother. We're going to the dealership down in Virginia, and he tells me to get ready, and he's getting ready. I go upstairs, he's putting on his polo uniform. The boots, the chaps, the whole, I said, what are you doing? What's with the full uniform? Intimidation. What do you see how intimidated they get? So we go in there, and he did make these guys very uncomfortable, just like he would have used his football uniform 10 years earlier. I heard that he was in a slammer at one time. <laughs> I hope not, but that's what I heard. Uh, I haven't heard from him for a long time. I accidentally ran into him when I was bouncing down on the Fort Lauderdale Beach when I first came down here in 70, probably 72 or 3. He came walking through the doors and was just like he always was. How you doing? See you later. <laughs> He's gone. I was going away. <laughs> he didn't waste much time, uh, you know. By chance, on uh, my 30th birthday, I was in a, a mall in Washington, D.C., and I'm, my mother went to buy me a suit for my birthday. And um, it's the weirdest thing. I'm, I'm in the mall, and I hear, I hear his walk. That, that, he's got that ice pick slim shuffle that he does, that kind of huggy bear type of pimp walk he does. And I'm, and I'm looking around, and I hear his walk. I see him. He's walking behind me. It's the first time I've seen him in 10 years. And I didn't, he looked like a WCW wrestler. Bell bottoms, long hair, he had a vest on, uh, QT all over his face, orange smudged all over. I mean, he just he looked like a, a character. And I, I started talking to him for a while, and he's telling me Bruce Willis stories. He's going to make a movie with Bruce Willis. He gave me an 800 number, and I called the 800 number one time, and uh, it just was a, an answer machine, and I, and I just never called the number again. So I, I don't know whatever happened to him. Eddie Pine told me that he was now, he wasn't king anymore, he was chief. That he was now an Indian. And that he was down in Maryland somewhere selling Indian jewelry or artifacts or real estate, but that he had the long hair and the earring, and it was no longer the king, now he was the chief. You know, and somehow he became, instead of the poor boy from Jersey City, now he was some uh, Cherokee manifestation, a reincarnation maybe of Crazy Horse. We asked everyone, where's the king? We were running out of time to finish our film, and we still didn't have a clue. Message one. Tuck, it's Ed Pine. How you doing? I just got a call back from my buddy in Baltimore. It's official. The, the, the king's on the lamb, and uh, no forwarding. And he owes the landlord uh, five months' rent, and he's looking for him. So he, he's officially on the lamb, and uh, nobody's able to find him. End of message. Just when we were about to give up our search, the king miraculously appeared. He called us right out of the blue. And when we showed up with a crew in Baltimore's Inner Harbor, there he was, in all of his glory. So what I do, say hello to somebody or what? Hey, guys. He had heard we were looking oh, for him. Right? And the king could never resist a camera. I have a tendency to date some kind of wild women, which I enjoy. I mean, we all got that wild side, right? Number over 24, 25. That's terrible to say on TV, isn't it? Uh, you had a kind of young. Know, once they hit 28, 29, and you're only as young as the girl you feel. That's yeah. King's. Uh... Yeah, right. <laughs> I like that. I like that. That's King's philosophy on women. Yeah, yeah. Say that again, honey, please. You're only as young as the girl you feel. You hear that? Oh, <laughs> she girl. I love it. I gotta use it. This is kind of funny because the last time I was in the car, I was in a Lincoln. Remember, I was talking about yeah, those long-haired hippie guys. You know what I mean? They're talking about what a crummy country is. A great country. And these guys said, "Oh, you're a capitalist. You're a capitalist." I says, hey, last night I got double teamed by two broads. What happened? You, you guys were in jail last night. I love the war. I hope they keep it on because it keeps the economy going and it makes more money for King Gorkin. I mean, look at me, man. I, I got a long head on those guys now. Actually, I went out to California for a while. Do you know I tried to be an actor for a while? Yeah, I tried that, but 
I couldn't take all the fags out there. Not, no reflection, I don't like homosexuals, but I mean, out there at that time it was kind of crazy and it were me, they were making me kind of nuts. And King, when the lights weren't on, was, was the nicest guy. And, and the most personable guy, just a friendly guy. There were times where he, would, he could be very empathetic and very soft and very kind. Well, now this is a big game, girls. We gotta, <laughs> we gotta score a touchdown. Now let's go. We gotta beat these kids. All right. Set. All right. Here we are, Patty. All right. Yeah, the beach. Man, I was a lifeguard living on the beach. They all had great boobs. And I was just running on the beach. <laughs> I was getting all the boobs and bounce. And you had great ass shots. All you guys, I noticed the, the shots. All you saw was great looking glutes and the boobs piled around. I said, who the hell cared when you got? But you guys, it was funny because guys loved it. That was a good shot. That was a funny shot in the beach. And then the other time, though, if there's a crowd there, he, he, was, he had to put on the dog. He was like a neon sign. And, and he wanted everybody to see where he was. He, he was a split personality, a true schizophrenic. It's the stories. It's just crazy stories, and it's, 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 it just, it's never, it's just delu it's like delusional stories. Your, your son was in the thing on the uh, J Jimmy Jr. Yeah, he. What's Jimmy Jr. Done? He's, uh, he's, he's an actor. He's out, out in L.A. now. Okay. It well, I, I have no desire to be famous. I don't want to be an actor. I don't want to be. I've, I've. Yeah, yeah son, death. He did a movie called Young Guns. He was in Young Guns. He was one of the cowboys in Young Guns. I don't know if you knew that or not, you know? The first strip strip guys, uh, what was that first group of the strip, the guys who were the strippers? The male strippers? Chippendale. The Chippendales. He was actually a Chippendale for about six months. It's constantly Hollywood and movie stars. I'm doing this and that, and I'm making this movie with this guy, and I know this, this actress wants to meet me. And it's just crazy stuff, and it just, after a while, you can't take it anymore. Matter of fact, I want you guys to come out to Vegas when we're doing a show out there uh, uh, August 6th, because uh, she's going to be out there with me. I'd like you guys to come out and tape when we're actually on stage singing. Come on, watch the whole show, you know? I, it's too crazy. It's, it's, too, it's too wacky. It, it's, it's, I, I wouldn't want him in my life now. He's just too, too, too crazy to be around. I, mean, like, I wish him well. I hope everything goes well for him, but I, I can't take any more Bruce Willis stories. It's too much. Don't try to call me or say that you care. Don't try to listen because I won't be there. This is life, man. This is quality of life. This is what it's all about. This is what being a king is. You know what I'm trying to say? This is why I do what I do, look like I look, and act like I act. His narcissism was, was pretty apparent. I hope we get the ball again. These pricks were giving two touchdowns and they ain't worth a shit. Him being in the team structure brought him back to a point of reality. Good plan, Holly. They're catching the ball. Good right. job, you guys. It's yeah. like Green Bay. Hell of a job, man. They can't, they can't cover sprint outs. I love playing with that team. I had a great time. Is it because they played with their heart? Played with their heart. The guys were fun. We laughed. We just had a good time. It never took it real serious. It was like uh, Pakistan with 300,000 people. You know, you lost 300,000 people. He'd have to drop a lot of defense mechanisms in order to fit in and, and, and be one of us. And so I think that that helped maybe helped him with some of the demons that he was dealing with and trying to figure out who he was and, and why he had these voids. With me, it was always my attitude. I always thought I had a pro arm. I always did have a pro arm, but they thought I was kind of wacky in the head. They thought I was kind of crazy. But on a football field, I, I was there. You follow me? And it's, uh, I, I enjoyed playing. I was a superstar in the minor leagues. We should have had 50 points. Go, score should have been 50 to 7 or 50 14. You name it, we had them there. We just had a real cast of characters. And we kind of all matched together. For, um, for some insane reason, we had an insane coach. We had Dave DiFilippo. I love Dave. He used to fall asleep at practice. And I loved his stories. He used to always spit on me when he talked to me. King, I want to talk to you, you know? Right. They're dropping off you unmercifully. You read me, don't you? Right. And I'd have a, my face mask. I have to put a towel. By the time I got done, I have to wipe my face off. And, and I don't think King can exist without being the king at some level. He has to be the, the, the center. I do girls, but I don't do drugs, booze, and I don't do cigarettes. You know what I'm talking Hey, hey, look who's here. How Christy. Are Hiya, baby. Maybe in truth, he just had this terrible inferiority complex that he had to overcome. You got to do all all this within yourself, and you got to find and be happy. And if you're always depending on other people or other things to do it, it'll let you down. <laughs> like, oh, Christy. <laughs> it's only beautiful, one king. Beautiful women. Okay, one beautiful king. women. One king. And uh, good clothes and good, friends, and good friends and good friends. And good friends. You just get a sense of a lot of voids inside of him, a lot of things that need to be filled up. <laughs> <laughs> girls, smile for the camera, okay? Yeah. These girls are perfect tens. You guys have been around a long time, right? You meeting more beautiful girls than this? King is losing his tan. Winter time's here. I, I don't know that he'll ever uh, grow out of it. I don't know that it's even a growth process. I think it's more of a, a psychosis. <laughs> He's looking like the guy's a madman, a total madman. I think King would have been uh, a good study maybe when 
he goes on to the other life. They could dissect his brain and figure out what's in there. Great. <laughs> Hello, good to see you. You look great. I watch you all the time on television. You must be up late every night, day, huh? every day, every day. In the spring of 2000, NFL Films joined with the Firebirds for their 30-year reunion. Most of the team was there, with one notable exception. And by the way, has anybody found where the king is? I didn't go to my high school reunion, I didn't go to the minor league hall of fame reunion. I don't do those kind of things. That's like going backwards. The king always goes forwards. I, I would love to see the guys, but I just it was to me it was kind of negative a little bit. I don't know, I just that was that was then, this is now. It makes sense? That was then, this is now. Herbie! Oh Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, we had all black hair. Yeah. He was a nice looking guy then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, King told me his philosophy on women at 14, and I was like, okay, you know. 19, you're already 19? You're already 19? Yeah, I swear to God. I swear. I thought you were like 12 years old. <laughs> you're not 19. Yes. What are you going to be doing here? Uh, I'm going to be singing. Singing. <laughs> Do you know where the king is? You know, we've been looking. No idea. Could you even guess? This is a custom-made tux. I got to make sure it fits me perfect right. I want the, the cuffs to lay perfectly on my boots. It's just instead of getting dressed for a football game, I'm getting dressed for stage. I got to be looking good, man. I'm gonna get this someday. I'm gonna make it my way. <laughs> Truthfully, I thought you know after the first reunion that we, I might never see some of you guys again, and uh, it chokes me. But <clears throat> yeah, Ken, you're ready. Game time. Are you nervous? Nah, you crazy? King never gets nervous. That's for mere mortals. <laughs> See you later, guys. It's true. It's uh, uh, it's like Dave DeFilippo said. You know, we only go this way once. Well, Zell, you have an accent. Yes. South Africa. South Africa. Wow. Yes. It's a king, man. I kind of pick up ah. things like that. You, know? <laughs> you definitely got the, the stamp of the king's approval. Is that the word to say? The king, the stamp of the king's approval. You know, I don't know how many people get chance to play on a championship team. I don't care if it's in grade school, high school, pros, I don't care what it is. But when you play on a championship team, there's a certain feeling you get. <laughs> there's all teen girls getting ready for their uh, show in their bikinis. Whoa. And I found it with the Firebirds. The reason we won wasn't because we were all great you know, heroes and great athletes. It's because we loved one another. <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, I still love you guys. We have a very special treat tonight. A good friend of ours has been a part of the American uh, Woman of the Year pageant. Ladies and gentlemen, Kim Corcoran and two very good friends. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it again. I'm gonna make it someday. I'm gonna make it someday. I'm gonna make it someday. And I can get me something good. Gonna make a great big show. And I am gonna get there. Get there, I've, I've had a lot of amazing experiences in the last 30 years, not the least of which was spending a year with most of you in 1970. This is from a uh, poem called Fern Hill by the Welsh poet uh, Dylan Thomas. And as I was green and carefree, famous among the barns, about the happy yard, and singing as the farm was home, 
In the sun that is young once only, time let me play and be. Golden in the mercy of his means, and green and golden, I was huntsman and herdsman. The calves sang to my horn, the foxes on the hills barked clear and cold, and the Sabbath rang slowly in the pebbles of the holy streams.